Hey there. A lot of people participate in gardening groups for a variety of different reasons. Whether you are there to be social, to learn, to give advice, or to get advice, I'm going to help you get the most out of your garden group experience. Today I'm going to give you four tips for being a good participant in your gardening groups, and then after that I will give you some advice for getting better answers to your garden group questions. I'm McCare with More Prana Gardens. Let's take a look. We're going to start off with what might be the hardest one in all honesty, which is to look up the things that you think you know. What if somebody posted a question in a garden group and they posted a picture of a plant and they said, what plant is this? And you're pretty sure you know, but you're not 100%. Or maybe you're 100%, but you've only seen that plant in pictures. You've never really experienced that plant yourself before. Go look it up. Look it up in a field guide. Look it up in a plant identification app. However you'd like to do it, verify it to reinforce your knowledge. You think you know it, you probably do, you might not. So just double check and make sure that what you think you know is actually true before you go and tell somebody else and spread misinformation or before you reinforce that wrong idea in your own head. Another reason that this is important is because our brains kind of layer our learning. We learn something as much as we can and then we go up to the next level and then we realize that we had gaps down here, so we have to dip down and learn. And then we learn most of what we need in this level, and then we go up here, and then we realize that we had gaps down here, which came from gaps down here, and we have to go down here and learn and then come back up again. So the more times you verify something you think you know, you are layering your learning because you can add little bits that you didn't pick up before. How do we know? How do we know what information to trust out there? You can make sure that an answer is consistent between several trusted sources. So if somebody posts a plant and you look it up in your plant ID and it says that is peppermint and you go to a field guide and it says that is peppermint and you find another website that says that it's pansy, that one oddball website's probably wrong. This second tip might seem kind of obvious, but look up things you don't know. I know. <laughs> You could just go in the comments and get an answer, but I am encouraging you to look up the answers before you look in the comments. Here's one that came up for me recently. The question was, when do I prune my apple tree and how? Well, that's something I'm having to learn. I am pruning apple trees for the first time this year. So before looking in comments and getting my head filled with possibly wrong ideas, I decided to go look it up and I spent some time on YouTube and I spent some time reading and and then when I go to the comments, I look up things that don't seem right. If the question is, when do I prune my apple tree? And the answers from all over the world are saying in February, something's wrong because it's going to depend on what your tree is doing and on your climate. So for me, the answer is February because I'm in North Texas and this is the only time that my tree is close to dormant. But for somebody in Australia, February might be very wrong. And also look up things that you don't need yet. Like in my example of the apple tree, that's something that I need this year. I didn't have answers to give, but seeing the question prompted me to go learn it. Do that with things that you don't think you'll need yet because we do layer our learning. And learning how to prune an apple tree might give you information about how it's different from pruning a pear tree, which you might need. Get that layered learning going, get the base information in your brain because you might need it later or you might need it on a related thing. Tip number three is going to be look up things you don't agree with. That one can be hard on the ego. I'm going to admit that. Well over a year ago, I came across the question, can I start my beets indoors? And I thought the answer was no. But I looked it up because somebody in there had said that they did it. And I was like, well, I've always been taught that you can't start root crops indoors, but maybe that's not so. And I started looking and it was hard to find information about it at first. But then I came across Charles Dowding's multi-sewing beets video. And not only does he start them indoors, but he starts a few in a cell and lets them grow that way. I didn't think any of that was possible. I didn't think you could start beets indoors. I didn't think you could multi-sew them. I didn't think you could transplant them. I was wrong. 
the common knowledge, the alleged common knowledge, was also wrong, and I had been going off that. But the point is, I saw a question with an answer that I disagreed with. I looked it up and found out that there were things I didn't know. Of course, which is why we try to keep learning forever and ever and ever. Always learn. So hey, if you have not subscribed yet, would you please hit that little subscribe bar? It lets YouTube know that people like you like videos like mine. And if you could, please, oh, please, oh, please, click a thumb. Thanks so much. Tip number four might sound a bit odd. It's going to be ask before answering. Sometimes questions come up in garden groups that need, they just need more detail. Here's a question that comes up frequently. There's a soft brown spot on my tomato, why? This one happens to be a pet peeve of mine, so hang with me here. The first and most common response in any garden group when somebody says there's a soft brown spot on my tomato, why? is going to be, you have blossom and rot, attack it with calcium. Ask questions before answering a question. Where is the spot on your tomato? If it's not at the blossom end, it's not blossom end right, end rot. It could be on the side. It could be on the top. It could be a stink bug bite. It could be a bruise from a windstorm when a stick blew by and hit it. There are a number of things that it could be with a number of causes. If it happens to be blossom end rot, if it happens to be at the blossom end, attacking your ground with calcium is not going to fix it. Not immediately. If you ask, where is the spot? And they say it's on the bottom. Did you have a lot of rain recently? Did you soak your garden faster than it could drain recently? Because blossom end rot is not about your ground not having calcium, it's about your plant not taking it up. And in most cases, the calcium in your soil is fine. Not always, definitely check it out if it's a persistent problem. But the more likely cause is overwatering, which is often a result of rain. So ask questions before answering. Make sure that you have as many details as you need about whatever's going on before you venture an answer so that you don't send somebody off in a wrong direction. Makes sense, right? And be sure that you provide detailed answers. If you're going to answer a question in a garden group, give that person as much information as they need to get it done without looking at further resources. Now, a smart person will look at everything you tell them and go verify it before they implement it, but give them as much to go on as possible. And finally, as I promised you, to get more out of your own post, remember to ask better questions. Give as many details as you can. Provide pictures or videos if you have them. For example, if I said, can I plant tomatillos next to my fence this week? Well, you don't know where in the world I'm located when I ask that question, unless it's in a location specific group. You don't know which side of my fence, if it's the sunny side or the dark side, or if my fence is solid or if it is slatted. You do because you watch my videos, but you know what I'm saying. You don't know if I have a freeze coming you don't know my trellising situation at that point. So if I was to ask that question, can I pl plant my tomatillos next to my fence this week? I will have not given you what you need to answer my question. So let's just run down a list of some things to include in your post to help you get the best answers that you can. You're going to include your location on the earth, the location of the plant in relation to other things like the fence, like a tree, like a bigger plant. You're going to include your regular care routine, how often you water, how often you feed your soil, if you amend the soil, anything like that, and any deviations from your routine. Like I normally water with compost tea on Tuesdays, but this week I was out of town and I didn't. Include any pests that you have seen in the area, specifically on the plant. Include what plants are nearby, any changes in appearance or texture of the plant, or any diseases that you have noticed on plants in the area or that you are unsure of. Include any treatments that you've tried. So you might know that I have tent caterpillars in the oak tree and I'm trying to deal with that. The first interaction that I used for that was to spray with BT a couple of times a week and that brought the numbers down, but not really enough. So if I was asking for help with that, I would include, I have tried regular treatments of BT and I would probably arrive at plant 
Dental and Phil. I don't know Dental and Phil, but plant fennel and dill if you have caterpillar problems. So now you know all about how to be a better participant in garden groups, how to get the most out of your participation, and how to get the best answers to your gardening questions. Take all that, hop into some groups, and get some stuff done. Later, y'all.